little bit of background on the Institute for Economic Development at UTSA. We have uh, actually about 11 programs that are focused on economic development in some form or fashion. Uh, a small business development center network that stretches uh, across 79 counties in South Texas uh, from uh, roughly El Paso to Corpus Christi. Uh, that same network extends into Mexico, Latin America, uh, the Caribbean. Uh, we have a rural business program that works with community leaders uh, uh, in that same geography, that 79 county uh, geography. Uh, it, my group does the research. Um, we uh, um, undertake economic uh, impact studies, uh, but also community development studies, fair amount of EB-5 immigrant investor uh, work, and the topics of course include the Eagle for Shell, but also <clears throat> the San Antonio missions and their impact on the local economy there. Uh, the UT system as a whole uh, we've done work with the uh, Economic Development Foundation in San Antonio on targeted indus industry recruitment and workforce analysis, and uh, as well as repurposing a military bases for commercial use. And our constituencies really run across the board. Uh, economic Development Corporations, of which there are over 600 in Texas, uh, city, state, government, really at all levels, businesses, associations, really anybody interested in uh, economic development. I like to describe the, the work we do at the Institute with a quote from uh, a great modern day philosopher, Yogi Berra, who actually passed this year, he said that in, th in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice there is. And so we sort of bridge that theoretical or academic side at UTSA with the real world. We try to bridge the two together. Uh, and hopefully our research is read by uh, policymakers and practitioners as well as uh, academics. And uh, much the way uh, Texas A&M is known for agricultural extension, uh, we, uh, we think that we've uh, got a pretty good practice uh, at UTSA, not only in cybersecurity, which uh, is a strong uh, area, up, up, uh, or down there, I should say, uh, but also economic development extension, where we try to kind of bridge some of that, uh, some of what we learn in academia to, to the real world. Uh, and then one other side note I want to make about uh, the uh, quest for several universities to become tier one here in Texas. Uh, Texas only has three tier one universities. The University of Texas at Austin here, Rice University and Texas A&M at College Station, and that's where the list ends. And uh, there's a tendency, uh, especially for folks like me who went to UT Austin, and say, well, we've got UT Austin, that's, that's, that's good enough. And it's really not. If you look at California, they've got nine tier one universities, and six of those tier one universities are in their University of California system. New York, with far fewer people than Texas, 19 million people versus 27 million people here in Texas, has six tier ones. We only have three. Uh, and the reason those are important is because tier ones, the communities that have them are associated with uh, more business startups, more patent applications, higher quality PhDs, and more federal research dollars. So uh, it really is critical that Texas, uh, hopefully at some point, gets up to about seven or eight tier one universities, which is the number we probably should have here. Uh, I don't know if a lot of you have seen this night shot of NASA from space, but for those of you who haven't, this is Dallas-Fort Worth there up at the top, Houston off to the right. This is where we are here in Austin. This is San Antonio. And underneath that, you can see sort of a crescent of lights underneath San Antonio. That is the Eagleford Shale. Uh, the rigs operate 24-7 out there, and they're flaring off some gas. So you can literally see it from space. Now, obviously, this is having a huge impact on the communities down there, uh, and that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. Uh, our uh, research area that we looked at in Eagleford uh, is a little different than the uh, Railroad Commission's definition of the Eagleford. We looked at the counties where most of the drilling's occurring, and then some adjacent counties where there isn't any drilling whatsoever, but they've either got, like Bear County uh, has San Antonio, which supplies a lot of the workforce or housing. Uh, some of the other counties are seeing a lot of port-related activity. So visually, uh, we studied the counties in green here, where most of the drilling activity is occurring, and then the adjacent counties in orange. The ones in blue, you'll hear the Railroad Commission talk about the Eagleford Shale. Uh, th uh, th that's in their definition. It's not in our study area simply because we had to draw the line somewhere in terms of cost. We've done four economic impact reports to date. I brought copies of the most recent one uh, with me today. Um, but all of them are available online. And as I said, I brought some business cards. If you'd like to get, any, you know, get a PDF version of one, I can send that to you as well. Just to quick, quickly highlight, the most recent developments in Eagleford Shale, we had seen huge numbers of drilling permits being issued over the past few years. Uh, as of September, we're up to about 1,800, which suggests that by the end of this year, next month, uh, we'll be at uh, maybe 2,500, 2,800 permits issued for the Eagleford Shale. So clearly the low price of oil has had an impact to the downside on the activity in the Eagleford Shale. Interestingly though, natural gas production continues to remain above 5 billion cubic feet per day. That's second, as far as I can tell, only to the Marcellus Shale, which produces about 16 billion cubic feet of natural gas per day. So it's interesting, even though the rig counts are way down uh, from 200 and maybe 25 a year ago down to less than 100 now, 
uh, production uh, for natural gas and oil actually continues to remain relatively robust. Uh, Eagleford produces, continues to produce over a million barrels of oil per day, uh, relatively on par with last year, and uh, it produces an awful lot of condensate, which is essentially an ultralight crude oil, a little over a quarter of a million barrels per day. Again, relatively similar to last year's numbers. So a question I'll get asked a lot is how much oil and condensate has the Eagleford shale produced to date? And the answer is 1.4 billion barrels. And that, uh, the total ultimately recoverable is, is estimated to be somewhere between 10 and 12 billion barrels. So there's a lot of life left in the Eagleford, not to mention the Permian Basin. Uh, these, this, this shale oil and gas that we're starting to see produced, we really just scratched the surface. And then this is a, just an interesting, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little uh, periodically about the difficulty of trying to make forecasts. This kind of highlights the EIA's difficulty in trying to forecast U.S. crude oil production in light of these, this, this, these shale developments. The, the, the lighter colored lines uh, toward the bottom are their older forecasts. And as you go up, you can see how they've continually had to revise them upward to account for the oil and gas production that's occurring here in the U.S. So it's just interesting to see that uh, they've, they've really had to kind of uh, revamped their numbers several times. Texas produces more oil than any other state in the U.S. Uh, I think that's pretty much been the case since uh, the early 1900s. Uh, interestingly, because of the Bakken up in North Dakota, uh, Nor uh, North Dakota is now the second largest oil producer in the U.S. They've overtaken both Alaska and California. Uh, Texas oil production, like I said, is, uh, is or, well, maybe I haven't said this, uh, is, is uh, at its highest level in at least 30 years. And the U.S. oil production overall is at almost record levels. Uh, uh, the last, I, yesterday's number suggested about 9.1 million barrels per day. We had been up to as high as 9.7 million barrels per day here in the U.S. The record was reached briefly in 1970 at about 10 million barrels per day uh, in the U.S. And there are, so there are now essentially three geographies in the U.S. that are producing over a million barrels of oil per day. The Eagleford in South Texas, the Permian Basin, and the Bakken up in North Dakota. All of them shale formations. Or, or, or the largely result of shale activity. And I don't want to leave, leave out natural gas. The U.S. is producing record levels of, of natural gas more than it ever has, over 25 trillion cubic feet annually, which is why we're starting to see uh, export terminals being constructed along the Gulf Coast, because we have so much of it, we literally have the ability to export it now. Uh, and I just want to talk briefly about energy consumption in the U.S. and how much energy we actually do use. Uh, annually in the U.S., we, we uh, consume about 100 quadrillion uh, BTUs a year, and the planet as a whole uh, uses 500 quadrillion BTUs. By 2030, that number is expected to be worldwide 600 quadrillion BTUs of energy. If we look at how it's produced, the electricity, the generation, electricity generation component of that, uh, even still, relatively small amounts are produced from renewables. That's if you take all uh, of them put together, solar, wind, hydro, electric and geothermal. If we add in nuclear, that's another 19%. So the remaining nearly 70% still comes from fossil fuels and, and most of it, the, the largest portion of it is still produced from coal. So one of the, the, the nice things about this shale oil and gas production is that increasingly we're able to uh, produce more natural gas, um, uh, electricity from natural gas uh, and at the same time reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and some of these I'm going to uh, skip over. I want to highlight how uh, 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 China has become a huge consumer of oil. And because we're producing more of it here, we import uh, less of it uh, uh, than we have in a long time. Uh, and our imports from OPEC countries, which peaked in 2008, have been declining steadily since then. And we expect that to continue to be the case uh, going forward. Um, just to kind of highlight the economic impacts, on the South Texas area of, of the Eagleford uh, as of 2013, and these numbers are probably representative of last year as well, $87 billion in economic outputs, up from uh, less than uh, or around $25 billion in 2011, supporting uh, over 150,000 full-time jobs, up from less than 50,000 jobs in 2011, and significant increases across the board in, in local revenues, state revenues. One of the reasons the Rainy Day Fund or the Economic Stabilization Fund, as it's formally called here in Texas, is so flush is because uh, of these oil and gas severance taxes that are coming from places like the Eagleford and the Permian Basin. Uh, by 2023, we had estimated $137 billion in economic impact, but that was based on EIA estimates of oil at remaining at $100 a barrel, which it clearly has not. Uh, I looked this morning, it's, it's trading just above $40 a barrel. Uh, if we, we try to uh, extrapolate those numbers out, just sort of the rough estimates at $65 a barrel, 
uh, if, if, if oil does firm up around that area, that we can expect about 48 to $68 billion in economic output. And instead of uh, almost 200,000 full-time jobs, maybe more like 72 to 100,000 full-time jobs. Nothing to sneeze at, but at the same time, not quite at the uh, levels that we had uh, uh, grown accustomed to seeing uh, over the past few years in the Eagleford. Uh, a lot of these uh, counties in South Texas have seen some um, uh, enormous increases in tax revenue. The example I always like to use is Carnes, uh, Carnes County, which is sort of ground zero for uh, the Eagleford activity, they went from uh, about $700,000 a year in, in uh, county tax uh, collections to over uh, $7 million uh, in, in the course of about three years. And uh, what we've been encouraging the communities to do with those increased tax revenues is to steward them wisely. It kind of kind of akin to the old bumper sticker that says, you, you know, you've seen them around. Lord, give me one more oil boom, and I promise not to blow it this time. So we we've been counseling these communities that there, there will be a time where prices will drop and things will slow down, and will you have something to show for it? Uh, one of the things I want to highlight is how the business models are very different from these unconventional producers versus where the major oil companies have, have migrated to over the years. Uh, in the past 40 years, the major oil companies have been focused increasingly on deep water projects, which require platforms like these, this one from Azerbaijan, that cost hundreds of, million hundreds of millions of dollars to complete and, and may be, it may take 10 years before they actually start producing any oil. Contrast that with uh, the Eagle, uh, well, with the shale oil and gas uh, production techniques, uh, which have come down. Uh, it used to cost 10 to $12 million to complete a well. Now it's six to $8 million. It used to take 40 to 45 days. Now it's done in 10 to 15 days, uh, sometimes as few as seven days. So the business models are just very, very different between the, what the shale producers are, are, are implementing ver, uh, as compared to the, the major oil companies, which have these big capital intensive projects. The, the, the uh, unconventional techniques can be started and stopped. There are probably 7,000 uh, wells in the U.S. that have been drilled, but haven't uh, been, uh, uh, that haven't produced yet. They've just, uh, they're holding off uh, because the hydraulic fracturing uh, process is one of the more expensive phases of production. So they're just waiting for oil prices to come back above $50, $55 a barrel before they start producing out of those wells. So just some interesting dynamics that are different uh, than uh, what we've been witnessing over the past 40 years or so in terms of the oil and gas industry. One of the things the, uh, uh, these companies are doing now a lot is using a lot uh, more technology, um, uh, much of which they've just scratched the surface on. This is uh, at the top of uh, an unconventional rig. Uh, they're also uh, making increased use of seismic imaging, uh, logistics, uh, and an example of that, well, let's see, I guess I don't have that here, but uh, uh, logistics, uh, uh, really just a whole host of uh, techniques to try and improve efficiency and really make it more, uh, the unconventional extraction, more like a manufacturing process as opposed to a wildcatting process. Um, the uh, rail logistics uh, or infrastructure that's been set up in, in South Texas um, well, hopefully, it, it was set up to serve the oil and gas industry and, and all the recent activity, recent developments there, but hopefully it'll serve as the foundation to support other types of industry in South Texas, including uh, agriculture. Uh, as an example of how that area has been transformed, this is the uh, uh, a picture of the Gardendale Rail Spur near Catula, uh, halfway between San Antonio and Laredo. Um, it had uh, been essentially an, ab an abandoned rail spur and the old joke was that uh, five years ago, if you wanted to find it, you would have had to use a metal detector to do it. Now it looks like this. They're bringing in sand, barite, uh, where pipelines aren't in place. They're shipping out crude oil. Um, so it's been, uh, for a lot of parts of South, South Texas, a transformative event. And as uh, Representative King mentioned early, a lot of these counties, as is the case of a lot of counties in West Texas, they had been losing population. That has changed, at least for the moment, and so they're hoping to capitalize on this opportunity to create uh, some, uh, some long-term sustainability uh, uh, that way. Um, I mentioned the fact that we're using more natural gas to generate electricity versus coal, which is good from an air quality standpoint. Um, I'm going to skip over a couple of these slides. I, I have some of these slides up here. To, this is to kind of highlight the fact that uh, our greenhouse gases come from lots of places, some of which are man-made, some of which are not. The anth anthropogenic uh, uh, parts uh, come partly from the energy industry, but also clearly, as, as, as you all know, from, from livestock and, and other, uh, other sources. Um, I think I've got a chart here about the, uh, 
yeah, here we go. The uh, uh, power sector emissions, uh, in and of itself, just the fact that we're using more natural gas to generate electricity has had uh, a huge impact on greenhouse gas emissions here in the U.S. And then these slides just kind of uh, uh, further that point. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, again, about the treachery of trying to make predictions. Uh, this one is a good one I like uh, from uh, 2007. Uh, Steve Ballmer, the former CEO for Microsoft, said that there's no chance that the iPhone's going to get any significant market share. No chance. And then uh, this one from uh, one of John Rockefeller's old partners in 1885, who apparently didn't think that oil would be discovered outside of the state of Pennsylvania. He said, I will drink every gallon of oil produced west of the Mississippi. And T. Boone uh, uh, doesn't have an entirely unblemished track record. In 2005, he had forecast that global oil production would peak at 84 million barrels per day. He says, I don't care what Putin or Abdullah or anybody else says, uh, you know, it's, it's not going higher than that. And yet in 2013, global oil production actually crossed the 90 million barrel per day mark and is it currently around, I believe, 93 million barrels at record levels. And then this is from my Oil Price Prediction Hall of Fame, who as recently as about a year ago, people who said that the price of oil would never, ever, ever go below $100 ever again. I was sure people had said it, but I couldn't remember who did or where they had said it. Uh, happily, the internet has a long memory and is very unforgiving in that regard. And so it was easy enough to, to track them down and, and, and put them on record here. So as I mentioned, we've seen the price of oil uh, drop significantly from $100 a barrel down to $40 a barrel with forecasts, some suggesting it could go even lower than that. And as a cautionary note, it's worthwhile to point out that in the roughly 150-year history of the oil industry, there have only been three periods of time on an inflation-adjusted basis where the price of oil has been over $50 a barrel. So um, it's, it's certainly for the rest of this year, I'm, I'm fairly uh, pessimistic about the price of oil getting much above $50 a barrel. Of course, we only have about a, a month and a half left uh, in this year. Uh, next year, we'll see. But uh, as I said, there's a lot of uh, latent production that could come online fairly quickly uh, if the price uh, does cross that $50 a barrel mark. Now, in our work with the communities in South Texas, we've been encouraging them to think about diversifying their economies. Uh, we saw what happened to Houston in the 80s when, when they were probably 90% dependent on oil and gas. So, uh, uh, and since then, they've, of course, diversified. I believe that their economy is somewhat less than 50% dependent on the energy industry. Uh, they've got financial services and healthcare and a host of other types of industries. Uh, and that's what we've been suggesting the communities in South Texas do, whether it's rediscovering their, their history and West Texas as well, I, I have to say, although there are opportunities for some of these diversifications areas of diversification aren't as robust as they are in South Texas. But whether it's using a, a, a mixed use uh, 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 development to encourage uh, downtown revitalization, forming linkages and alliances, uh, working with elected representatives at all levels, there's a host of strategies that we've been encouraging them to employ. And again, this will speak to uh, Representative King's comments about the challenges that rural communities have with regard to their representation in the state legislature. This is a pie chart from some uh, selected central Texas counties in 1890, and, you can, and it includes Travis County, where we are right now. And you can see that the population in Texas, which used to be a rural state, was relatively evenly distributed. And that also meant that representation in the state legislature was also reasonably evenly distributed. If we fast forward to 19, or 2010, we can see that the shifts have occurred largely through population growth, but, but even from 2000 to 2010, there were still 79 counties in Texas that did lose population, most of them in West Texas. Uh, you can see how uh, the shift in terms of, of state, state representatives, state senators, has shifted to the, the major urban areas, basically to the cities in the Texas Triangle, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, Austin, and San Antonio. Uh, Mayor of Abilene said at a conference uh, a couple years ago that there are more state legislators in Harris County uh, where Houston is than there are in all of West Texas. And, and it's not like the large cities don't have issues, for example, with regard to roads, uh, the, the, the ones, you know, because the, the, you know, rural communities have those types of issues as well. And so they're competing with the large cities with a much smaller uh, uh, voice. Uh, we've been encouraging the communities, uh, the rural communities to sort of band together to kind of take a collective case up to the legislature to make up for the fact that they're, they have fewer representatives than they used to. Uh, and then uh, along the lines of, uh, 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 you know, developing uh, uh, long-term plans to try and ensure their sustainability, uh, basically we've been encouraging them, them with this additional tax revenue to be looking at uh, 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 
infrastructure, uh, which will form the foundation to, to support other types of industry, whether it's uh, better roadways, uh, affordable broadband networks, uh, improved medical facilities, water, wastewater treatment, K-12 education, because if you want families to move to your community, you're going to have to have good K-12 schools. Uh, and the aesthetics are important as well. But what are the things that are, will be useful to, or will cause people to either want to visit, uh, uh, move in, or, or what will attract uh, industry to the area? Uh, essentially, uh, uh, sort of borrowing from Richard Florida, uh, it's a question of what's there, who's there, and what's going on. Um, as I, I've mentioned in a TED talk I gave recently, there are at least 200 ghost towns in Texas. One author says there may be a thousand or more of them. And so in Texas, we don't need any more ghost towns. The communities that are still viable, we need to find a way, figure out a way to make them viable for the long term. Um, and uh, uh, just highlighting in our, our last report, some of the communities that are sort of doing a good job uh, uh, addressing these issues are, are Gonzales, which is the birthplace of the Texas Revol Revolution. They've got uh, historical tourism as well as recreational tourism opportunities. Their downtown has, has been uh, uh, revitalized oops, substantially and uh, it's becoming a destination location. Uh, Carn City, uh, they're starting to revitalize their downtown as well. Uh, Pleasanton, birthplace of the cowboy, they've done some, some interesting things uh, with their uh, uh, new community center and new library. Uh, this picture up at the top is when it was being constructed about a year and a half ago. Uh, and then Catula, uh, which is along I-35 and has some potential as a free trade, uh, free trade area, and they, they're going to uh, hope to capitalize on, on NAFTA-related traffic. So uh, also Crystal City, uh, there are lots of opportunities for uh, uh, spinach growing in South Texas. Uh, and interestingly, I think that's my next slide, South Texas is a really good place to grow olive trees. Uh, and it's interesting that the, uh, um, the woman uh, that, that uh, first tried to plant these as far as, at least as far as we can tell, let me forget her name, uh, Sandra uh, Winokur that uh, has uh, Sandy Aches olive, uh, olive groves, uh, or olive orchard uh, in South Texas. Uh, she actually experimented with 38 varieties of olive trees before she found uh, uh, the, the ones uh, that would work most successfully, Arbicania uh, being one of them, but her first batch of 1,000 olive trees from uh, Egypt actually died. And so uh, uh, years ago when she started to try and uh, plant them commercially, uh, she was ultimately able to make them succeed. And, and more and more now we're seeing places like the Texas Olive Ranch and, and uh, uh, other, other ranch olive ranches uh, uh, producing olive trees and olive oil. And the U.S. imports 95% of the olive oil it consumes. So uh, it's turned out to be uh, one interesting area for diversification uh, agricultural diversification in, in South Texas that uh, years, uh, not that long ago, uh, we didn't really even suspect existed. Um, wildlife photography is also another uh, opportunity for diversification uh, in South Texas where ranches can generate uh, income. Uh, this just speaks to one of the reasons we've seen the population shifts uh, away from the rural areas and toward the cities. Uh, just looking at uh, the, the composition of the workforce that used to be involved in agriculture versus the roughly 1.6% that's involved in agriculture now. All right, and then just to kind of highlight opportunities for uh, diversification in South Texas, as I mentioned, uh, olives, uh, olive oil, uh, but also water desal, uh, biofuels potentially. There are places where geothermal energy can be produced in South Texas, and then tourism in, in, in all of its forms, uh, historical recreation, ecological. I've, I've got a list here of some quality of life components. Again, I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these slides, but I get asked a lot about, you know, well, what is quality of life? Uh, and I decided rather than have it be an abstract concept, I, I, I tried to put together a, an actual menu of things that constitute uh, uh, what people generally consider to be quality of life. And along those lines, public amenities, and then some projects that are actually underway in the Eagleford area as a result of this, uh, this sort of recent newfound wealth. And just some, some ideas related to quality of life in public places. Okay, I'm going to skip through some of these. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's interesting to know why we've built a lot of relatively sterile cities. In fact, f for up until recently, we've tended to build cities around cars instead of people. So this is kind of highlighting uh, some of the things that do work in terms of gathering points and, and things that don't.
And then gateways, really important. A lot of times we'll drive through a city in Texas, we won't even know which city it is, and it's a good way for communities to sort of uh, market themselves. So to borrow another quote from Yogi Bear, the, the future ain't what it used to be. And uh, I'm gonna have a little fun now. Uh, my apologies to uh, those of you that aren't from Texas. Uh, some of these slides uh, I, I would not use uh, in Nebraska, for example. I don't think they'd resonate quite that well there. Uh, but but folks here tend to appreciate them, so I'm gonna uh, kind of go through it. One of the things I, I, I thought was interesting, this uh, is actually an outline of the US, and, and a group of Brits were given this picture to fill in. And it's kind of interesting, and I'll, I'll roll through some of the, their, their guesses as to what states were which, but what's uh, really interesting is that they always knew where Texas was. The Midwest really gave them a lot of trouble. Walter White somewhere around here. Uh, they've got New Hampshire down here. <laughs> There's one here, I expect, yeah. Uh, Oklahoma's North Texas. Like I said, in every instance, they, they knew where Texas was. And so, so with these last few slides, I'm going to have a little fun with the fact that we are here in Texas. It, it was a lot more fun being here when oil was at $100 a barrel than at $40 a barrel, but I'd, I'd still rather be in Texas than anywhere else. One interesting thing uh, I, I found was from the Texas Monthly, actually it was this last August edition, uh, apparently more books have been written about Texas than any other state in the Union. In fact, any, uh, in fact all of the other states put together. Uh, it's just, uh, it's really fascinating how Texas uh, has, has captured the imagination of, of so many folks. This is, a, 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 I love this uh, chart, it's the number one selling vehicle by state. I was pretty sure the F-150 was the number one selling vehicle in Texas. But it's the number one selling vehicle in a lot of places. Nebraska, uh, not California, they, their number one selling vehicle is the Prius. Everybody guesses the Prius. No, it's the BMW 3 Series. So. And then it's so hot in Texas, we actually had to install fans outside. <laughs> I, have this, I have this slide up here in part to highlight the fact that Texas is actually the number one wind energy producer in the U.S. It's not California. Some things you'll only see in Texas. <laughs> and I know we've talked a lot about the drought, and I think for a while a lot of us were looking at a new rain gauge. And I, this is, uh, I don't know if you've, a lot of you or any of you have been to the Oasis in Austin, here in, in, in uh, uh, actually over by Lake Travis, but it's a, a map of the U.S. that finally puts Texas in the proper perspective relative to the rest of the U.S. And then something uh, uh, from uh, my part of the world or down in San Antonio, only Texas could turn defeat into a legend and a song and a tourist attraction and a major motion picture. And then uh, from Sam Houston, Texas is the finest portion of the globe that's ever blessed my vision. But in the final analysis, and again, my apologies to those of you who aren't from Texas, but uh, in Texas, we really feel like there's only two states in America. There's Texas, and there's not Texas. <laughs> and with that, I thank you for your attention.